we're live, let's begin. <laughs> Welcome everybody, thank you so much for joining us today, this Friday, um, April 30th. We are here, um, we're, well, everyone is where they are. I don't know where the here is, <laughs> but you're all joining us for our very last long 2020 talk um, hosted by the Center for 21st Century Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. I am the deputy director of C21 and Maureen Ryan. Very happy to have you all with us. And our speakers today are Carrie Costello and Mackenzie Wark. And um, I'll just say a few logistical things and then I will introduce our speakers and then I will hand it over to uh, C21's director, Richard Gerson. And then we will get started on our talks. So if you're joining us in Zoom, welcome. Hi, you are, um, we're doing this in webinar mode. So you are, you, your camera and voice are off. I'll ask you to use either, you know, we, it ends up working either way. I've in the past, asked people to use Q&A. Sometimes people use chat anyway. It's really, either is fine, but you can leave a question in the chat or in the Q&A function um, at any point. So they'll stay there until we reach the point of the discussion where we brought in it out and bring in um, discussion questions. So feel free to do that at any point. If you're joining us on YouTube, you can also leave a comment there. We'll be moderating those and we'll ferry them into the Zoom chat and um, go from there. So um, I'll introduce our speakers now. Uh, we're gonna go in alphabetical order. So Carrie Costello is our first presenter. Carrie is Associate Professor of Sociology and Director of the LGBT Studies Program at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Costello engages in research in embodied experience and interventions into embodied identity. In one line of research, he studies the regulation of sex and gender through medical interventions into the bodies of intersex and transgender people. In another, he examines embodiment in virtual settings. In a longitudinal study of avatar embodiment in the virtual world of Second Life, he studies how identification with the avatar body facilitates experiences of sensation in virtual flesh and the therapeutic uses to which people put their avatars. Welcome, Carrie. Our next speaker is Mackenzie Bork, Professor of Culture and Media at the New School's Parsons School of Design and Eugene Lane College of Liberal Arts. She has published widely on media theory, critical theory, new media, and the Situationist International. Her recent publications include Capital is Dead, General Intellects, 21 Thinkers for the 21st Century, Molecular Red, Theory of the Anthropocene, and The Spectacle of Disintegration. Welcome. So now, Richard, if you will just say a few words about the center, the long 2020, and then we'll get started. Um, good afternoon, I'll be brief. Uh, as Maureen mentioned, this is the last event in our long 2020 series, um, which has been preparatory for uh, a book that we, the two of us are editing, which should be out sometime in 2022. The long 2020 stretches quite a while, I guess. Um, and uh, it's really a pleasure to, have our final event of the series dealing with trans issues. And it's really a pleasure to have Carrie and Mackenzie here. Um, Carrie has been really my guide to uh, the politics of trans issues since I arrived at UWM uh, through Carrie's blog posts and uh, Facebook posts. I've really received uh, an incredible education about uh, what it means to be trans in Milwaukee for one thing, and but I think generally in the academy and so forth. Um, Mackenzie, is, it's also great to have Mackenzie here uh, because she was uh, one of our speakers in the second big conference we did back in uh, 2012, I believe, the dark side of the digital. And so it's nice to have her back here uh, for this conference. And also because um, I've, received some education on trans issues from Mackenzie as well, from following her Twitter stream and from uh, comments on a, an infelicitous Facebook post that I made a few months ago that was not, that was just, let's just leave it at that. It was an infelicitous post. The intentions were not, the intentions were good. I just, and I was educated. Uh, by Mackenzie and others about uh, how to address uh, certain issues in regards to trans identity. So I'm really grateful uh, to have both Carrie and Mackenzie here. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is 
that this is not only the last uh, event in our 2020, Long 2020 series, but this is the last event uh, that Maureen, Ryan, and I will be uh, official, officiating at uh, for the center. So Maureen will be leaving uh, UWM this summer to take a assistant professor position at the University of South Carolina in Columbia. And I'll be uh, returning to the rank and file of the uh, professoriate and teaching in the English department uh, for the next few years as I contemplate uh, life after academia. So with that, I'm happy to turn the screen over to Carrie. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, hopefully my volume will be okay. Um, eh, now, the, the long 2020 series may not be interminable <laughs> and uh, our positions in academia may not be interminable, but 2020 really did seem never to end. Is that not so? <laughs> um, and we spoke a lot about the fact that it seemed endless, that we were isolated at home we had uh, communal conversations about our joint doom scrolling um, and whether or not it was good for our mental health, with the conclusion being that it was not. But we couldn't stop. Why could we not stop? <laughs> well, we couldn't stop because not just was there a pandemic going on, but because of issues that predated 2020 um, related to uh, news and communication in the era of Donald Trump. <laughs> um, who generated crisis after crisis as his main means of governing, <laughs> um, which uh, kept everybody quite engaged in an extremely anxious manner. <laughs> so uh, Trump uh, functioned by generating outrage um, and that energizes, quote, the base and everybody else as well <laughs> um, and makes people engaged in a really negative, interminable way. <laughs> Um, and this happened from the very outset of his administration. So it was not unique to 2020, but you may remember um, even before Trump took office, there being uh, the first sort of crises when news reporting uh, came out about uh, there being a lot of false news stories circulating around the time of the election about buses of quote illegals um, being driven from place to place, voting en masse over and over again. And these were not true and they were um, constructed by trolls in Russia. <laughs> um, and there was some news reporting about that. And what happened was that immediately at the outset of the um, Trump administration, these were, uh, th this complaint <laughs> was turned on his head and directed back at the fact checkers. Um, and uh, Trump claimed that the media, the mainstream media were themselves fake news. That's the fake news. Don't believe what you hear, don't believe what you see. Um, it's all lies. Uh, and quickly in 2017, um, we began to see these inversions coming faster and faster. So uh, you recall the um, Charlottesville uh, right, uh, alt-right rally in Charlottesville and uh, in which a woman was killed by a, a member of this um, alt-right gang um, driving his car into the crowd. And in the aftermath, um, Trump being given a very simple situation in which to uh, say he's a rational human being and doesn't believe that we should have Nazis killing people, instead said, uh, uh, that why is there no critique of the so-called alt-left who provoked the alt-right and framed anti-fascism as provocative and fascism as just one more set of political beliefs equally valid with any other. Um, and the inversions of reality sort of piled up. Um, things that we thought of as good, like not hurting other people, uh, justice, social justice, empathy are, were presented as oppressive. Um, somehow liberty required putting kids in cages and not giving trans kids a place to pee. Um, and uh, we have literal Nazis saying that having to wear a face mask to protect other people is fascism. Uh, so 
what is this business of inversion? And this business of inversion that really generated great adulation for Trump from those who were in his fan base because it liberated them from a sense of guilt and shame over treating other people cruelly. What, what energized him so much is uh, was having a president say, okay, men, step up. You're the real victims, victims of feminism. Take the red pill. Um, oh, well, women, you're not left out either. You're victims of the trans agenda. Uh, Christians who are refusing to uh, tolerate LGBT people, you're actually the victims. You are persecuted. They're throwing you to the lions. <laughs> um, you know, refugees in cages uh, were really uh, criminal invaders taking over our land. So all of these uh, inversions are taking place in which bigotry is being presented as an item of faith uh, and the people who are being discriminated against are presented as attackers. Um, not that that is novel or new to this era, the Trump era or to 2020. Um, it, there's a longstanding tradition of associating faith and the Bible with systems of oppression, for example, slavery, um, or during the civil rights era of the 1950s, where it was claimed by white evangelical Christians that the Bible required segregation, and those who resisted that were um, agents of the devil, and they called Martin Luther King Jr. the Antichrist. Um, nor was it novel for sex, gender, and sexual minorities to uh, face this, this, this uh, idea that um, faith requires discrimination against LGBTQ plus people, uh, you know, was really consolidated in the 1970s with Anita Bryant's Save Our Children campaign saying that if we have civil rights for uh, lesbian and gay people, then somehow children will wind up being sexually abused by them because they'll become teachers or somehow be enabled by, non by employment non-discrimination to get into bathrooms and attack um, children. So the stuff is not new, um, but what was new was the way that the group is being portrayed that is adopting this perspective. So in the 1970s and 80s, um, we saw the consolidation of white evangelical Christian opposition to LGBTQ plus rights being presented as a moral majority, and that was the term that the group adopted, <laughs> facing off against this strange immoral fringe that needs to be prevented from contaminating the majority with their dangerous minority opinions. Um, but now we saw instead the pre presentation of the white evangelical Christian opposition to LGBTQ plus rights as evangelicals being oppressed by an elite and LGBTQ plus people as the empowered and dangerous majority. Um, this is an example of a classic tactic called DARVO, D-A-R-V-O, which stands for Deny, Attack, and Reverse Victim and Offender. DARVO is a term that is invented by criminologists to describe the standard response when an abusive person is um, called out on their behavior. Well, what they do is they deny that their abuser, attack the whistleblower and say that they have bad motives and then reverse victim and offender and say, no, I did not abuse my victim. Actually, I am the victim and they are the abuser. And this is a standard pattern happens over and over again. Well, that's what we see as a political tactic in 2020. Um, so now, uh, when fact uh, when, when fact finders present evidence of the uh, effects of oppression on LGBTQ plus people, that gets claimed to be false information, and so the whistleblower is attacked as partisan and an enemy of the group that is doing the oppression. Um, but also what we really need to focus on are
people who are being, um, who are the, the, the focus of the oppression itself. And so that is, in this case, LGBTQ plus people um, who are being framed as attacking those who would deny them rights. Um, and there is something really weird about focusing the framing Christianity by white Christian evangelicals as centering around the need to reject sex, gender, and sexual minorities. So this idea that, you know, what it means to be a Christian is to not accept same gender marriage, uh, deny that gender transition is possible, um, be uh, an advocate for abstinence only sex education, be anti-abortion, all these sexual and gender identity related things, which actually are not discussed in the New Testament at all. That is, Jesus has nothing to say about, about any of those things um, whatsoever, absolutely zero. And rather, uh, instead, a lot to say about the necessity of feeding the hungry and welcoming the foreigner and um, not casting stones at people you think may be sinning. But though the New Testament itself has nothing to say about sexuality as the center of Christianity, that is how contemporary white evangelical Christianity is framing their religion. And we can see that when we look at the Equality Act. So that is the act that's currently being debated in Congress that would grant protection for people based on sexual orientation and gender identity, which, is, which was framed by evangelical preacher Rick Joyner and this spread all over the right-wing social media, um, calling the Equality Act, quote, a bill to criminalize Christianity. And that is Christianity being defined as discriminating against LGBTQ plus people. Um, in Congress, you have Warren Boebert, who, um, who says that the Equality Act is proving, is an attempt to impose a supremacy of gays, lesbians, and then she goes, uh, 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 and comes out with transvexites. <laughs> um, that that is what the Equality Act is. It's queer supremacy. Now, this is all inversion. And when I say that, what I mean is in 2020, in fact, at least 350 trans people were murdered um, around the world for being trans. Um, bills were proposed in states all over the United States to force the misgendering and disrespect of trans kids and adults. Um, and COVID itself disproportionately impacted LGBTQ plus people, especially trans people, because people who are marginalized have poor access to healthcare, greater levels of, um, of pre-existing conditions due to the effects of discrimination and often wind up having to live in um, crowded and, uh, and unsalubrious conditions and all those things contributed to higher rates of, of COVID. But uh, the Trump administration, administration spent 2020 attempting to eliminate any protections on the basis of gender identity in healthcare. That is ensuring a right to discriminate against uh, trans folks in healthcare. Um, and I know because I went and got tested for COVID a number of times, federally supported federal testing for the virus, um, in order to register for it, you were required to, if you're trans, misgender yourself because you had to state the sex that was on your birth certificate at birth. Even if you've changed that <laughs> legally, um, that, that would not be recognized. I invested a bunch of time trying to uh, marshal the resources of you know, the administration of my university to do something about this testing provided at our university requiring trans people to be misgendered, but the entity that was providing the services, it's just required by federal law, that's what you have to do. And that didn't disappear, by the way, with the Biden administration. The same thing happened when I went to go get vaccinated at the university um, in 2021. So it is a very long 2020. <laughs> um, you still had to say what your sex on your birth certificate at birth was. The result in all of this was, uh, a surge in, uh, in intensity of discrimination and uh, gender policing against trans folks, especially trans feminine people. Um, and as a result, what you saw was social isolation, especially for trans feminine people, pre-existing 2020. So when the pandemic social isolation came down, 
This was not something new for folks who are trans, especially trans feminine people. I see Richard, are you wishing me to, no, nope. I should continue. All right, I, wish I shall continue. <laughs> um, so what you see then um, is an inversion when it comes to the bills that we are now seeing that started in 2019 and went through 2020 and here again in 2021, uh, seeking to um, prevent the participation of trans girls and women in government funded sports, you know, school sports, that means. Uh, and what these are is a great example of DARPA because the real thing, if you want to talk about the participation of trans people in sport or exercise generally, that you see, if you actually survey or look at trans folks, is that trans people are, it's not, there. not only do we not have domination of women's and girls sports by trans women, we have almost no participation by trans folks in sport at all. As a matter of fact, a bunch of the states that are passing these bills are passing them in the absence of being able to find evidence of a single trans girl that has participated in sport in the state, but they're passing bills against it. And what is the real condition is that you have trans folks and especially trans feminine, non-binary and binary people is uh, folks not doing any exercise at all. It can be unable to, ex to access a gym or a pool or the beach or even a public space safely because of the high levels of gender policing. Um, there also was in 2017 and 18, a series of bills that didn't really pass or passed in just a few states to limit access to bathrooms. The fact that they didn't pass is irrelevant because what did happen is that all across the United States now, you have business owners who believe that it's illegal to access a bathroom as a trans person. Um, and it has made it very difficult for folks to go outside their homes or travel. Um, so especially for people who are not living in large coastal cities with large populations of um, LGBTQ plus people and Democrats, folks are just isolated at home a lot. And that made 2020 weirdly comfortable for many folks that I talked to, because what happened was we had like the, the, the general population sort of joining trans folks, especially trans feminine folks in an experience they were already having of being, of staying at home, of being scared of encountering people on the street and of mostly communicating through social media. The difference was that now all these people who are now joining <laughs> already socially isolated trans folks is that they were so they were just talking about you know this ton of bricks falling on them how incredibly uh, difficult it was and how hard it is on their mental health while the trans folks who had already been socially isolated in this way had been told well you know get over it you chose that um, it, it, it's not a big deal if you don't like it stop transitioning <laughs> you're the one who decided to be weird um, you know, what did you expect when you transitioned that people were going to not make fun of you? I mean, uh, and, and, and combined with, you know, unhelpful advice, like, you know, people deciding you should dress more or less feminine or masculine, and somehow you would avoid gender policing, which is unhelpful. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, could, I could cut it here, or I could add one more thing. I could add one more section. It's up to you. One more? All right. So let me just talk about gender ideology then. <laughs> So here, the, 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 a big reversal that we see, a DARVO reversal, has to do with what constitutes gender ideology. And it's strange when you have, on the one hand, Trump backing Republican evangelical white Christians, and on the other, feminists of a certain flavor, TERFs, <laughs> trans exclusionary radical feminists, and like the Pope, all on the same page, <laughs> complaining about something they think is terrible and horrible that they call gender ideology. <laughs> now, when these three groups speak of gender ideology, what do they mean? What they mean is that in up until the past couple of years for all of eternity, there was never any idea of gender. There was only sex. Sex is real. Gender is a recent invention of some people in their heads. Gender is fake. Uh, sex can be measured. Gender cannot, because it's in your head somewhere. How could you measure that? Um, and nobody had ever thought of something like a non-binary gender or a gender transition or uh, seeing an intersex person as not disordered until 
very recently, and it's a bad, bad thing. It's endangering folks. It's putting women and girls, that is to say, endosex cis women and girls, in danger of being attacked by, I don't know, people with sex varying body parts existing. Um, and this is a classic example of DARVO in that, in fact, this is the ideology because sex and gender have never been binary. <laughs> that is to say, intersex people have always been born, so have intersex dogs and cats and horses and pigs and chickens and every single species that you care to look at. <laughs> um, gender transitions and non-binary non -binary genders are part of world cultural history all over the world. In fact, when you survey world historical cultures, the most common number of sex gender categories you find seems to be three. And you have four and five and six gender systems, etc. And the idea that only sex is real because you can measure it with an instrument and you can't measure something in your head, well, it's very strange to be asserting that as your position of authority. If, say, you are an evangelical <laughs> Christian, because I can tell you one thing you can't measure, and that's religious identity or belief. It, you know, it, you can't get the scalpel out and cut that off either. Um, and the turfs, are, you know, are, are uh, one of their main claims is that um, that trans masculine people are really lesbians who've been forced through conversion therapy to turn into boys. And they're really into protecting sexual orientation. Another thing you cannot measure find in the body, <laughs> see. So according to them, fake, just like gender is. <laughs> it's a very strange argument. Anyway, it's all Darvo. Darvo is terrible <laughs> and it results in bad things. And during the questions, I'd be happy to talk about some examples of how it has popped up in, um, in my own experience numerous times. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Carrie. Uh, McKenzie, screen's all yours. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, I, I've, I think I can do a lot with this concept. Uh, I'm going to do something a little different, and let me just arrange uh, so I can see my text and see you all. Uh, I call this the reign of frogs. Much talk during the pandemic circled around the question of returning to normal, as if this would even be desirable, as if there might still be norms to which anybody might return. Now, the word normal derives from norma, Latin for the carpenter's square, a human-made device that approximates to a, a geometric figure, uh, a version of the real that never perfectly appears. Now, normativity might then refer to the way human practices sort of oscillate around norms that can never be. And yet what seemed to become normal in the long 2020 was the spectacle of its own disintegration. It now takes a truly impressive effort to perceive this climate of fire and flood according to the old norms. It seems that in political life, no norm is actually sacred. And when it stands in the way of a ruling class in need of a little state assistance to maintain the transfer of resources ever upwards, the techniques in which we all uh, live our lives are now uh, enmeshed, uh, in, in which our lives are now enmeshed and now sort of unbound from any inherited norms of information regulation. So then speaking of biblical things, it's reign of frogs time. Panic about the erosion of norms is then channeled towards ever more marginal figures. The frogs, the portent, the sign, for much of the long 2020 was the supposed rain of transsexuals splashing all over the media sphere. Over the long 2020, I lost count of the states considering legislation to make the lives of transgender people and we're about 1% of the population considerably worse. It gets hard to practice optimism of the will in those circumstances. Just looking around at my everyday life, the things upon which uh, one might rest, if not optimism, at least a sense of ongoingness, though, are the practices of love and care and support people are learning with each other in the absence of what once wants normal life. And then I'll come back to that. I want to revisit for a moment the image of the norma of the carpenter square 
the norma et regular, the level and the square from which came normalis, that which conforms to the square. The normal is something that is imposed on material through a practice. In the original case here by the carpenter, sizing up the wood, the norm comes from without. It's not inherent in the wood itself. From the crooked timber, nothing is ever made straight, as Kant said. And that can be read in a conservative way, as Isaiah Berlin did, uh, as a way of dismissing any sort of utopian dream. It's curious how the word conservative, the word conservative now has quite the opposite meaning to that, though. One was perhaps always, that one that was there, perhaps always there, latent in conservative desires. Now the conservative is the one who takes the ruler to the human and cuts off anybody that isn't, in every sense of the word, straight. The warped body is to be examined, ruled upon, brought into line, or ruled out. The body, after the work of ruling it straight, is then, strangely enough, considered natural. Uh, the artist Tourmaline and others have warned uh, a few years ago now that trans visibility is a bit of an ambivalent thing. To be seen might be enabling in that other trans people can see us and come out. To be seen might uh, make open-minded cis people understand us better, normalize us as part of the human community, which is fine if you're a trans person who wants to be normal. I, I don't really. Uh, in any case, visibility brings with it the possibility of surveillance and control. In the bathroom, the locker room, in school, on the playing field, the trans body, particularly that of tr the trans woman, becomes all too visible. That which can be perceived can become an object of the norm and ruled against. As legislation, many of the bills aimed at opposing norms on us failed. Uh, the campaign to legislate us out of civil life, however, do their work uh, even when they don't become law, as Kerry was suggesting. Establishing the contours of what the right people are supposed to be on the lookout for, upon which to impose the norm on their own volition. The conservative imposition of the norm responds in some ways to a liberal attempt to shape another one. Trans visibility means mostly young, attractive trans women who pass, who are elegantly turned out and who approximate cis womanhood, who even when they're not white can code switch into the English of normal white speech. And if we're talking about older trans women, they better be rich. It rarely means trans men. It's highly selective about uh, what non-binary body can look and sound like. Actually, not much has really changed about trans visibility since uh, Christine Jorgensen became a global celebrity in the 1950s. To be trans in the long 2020 is to then be caught between two norms, and one is preferable to the other. But not for all of us and not always. To avoid the straightening gaze of the conservative norm, one has to approximate to a liberal one by showing one is normal in another way, a valid representation in the spectacle and a legislative subject, a legitimate subject of civil life. Liberal and conservative norms appear to differ according to the rule against which one is to be measured, sex or gender. And a great deal of mischief enters the language through the distinction between sex and gender. The distinction arose out of sexology, out of the discovery of how wildly non-normative the sex of the body could be, and nearly a century ago now. In frustration, sexology sets up the supplementary category of social gender so that the non-normatively sexed body, particularly the intersex one, can be cut to fit what sexology took to be the more rigid binaries of social gender. Oddly enough, these pair of terms are now normally used in the opposite sense, a switch that happens after second wave feminism adopted the concepts for the opposite purpose. Sex is now taken to be rigid and inflexible. It is gender that can be changed through the struggles of a social movement. A very white Western colonial norm of the sex, particularly of a woman, is then often left in place. That the collective labor of a social movement could upend norms of gender, but then falls out of certain kinds of uh, feminist discourse. Uh, what I'm actually gonna call trans excoriating reactionary feminism, uh, has in common with the conservative norm, a treating of sex as a fixed binary, as biological and resisting the mere modification of social gender. 
Uh, even those modifications that might open possibilities for cis women are shut down in the name of excluding trans women. Normal womanhood is then defined as weakness in need of protection, shackled by biological necessity to the uterus. Liberal discourse usually points to a different norm without really challenging this reading of the relation of sex and gender. It generally accepts uh, that sex is something fixed, but stresses gender as a social construct that can be modified. Space can then be made for tolerating the non-normatively gendered as an act of sympathy to be bestowed by liberal power, but only in return for conforming to its norms. The alternative to both might be the path queer theory marked out for us, but that too has its traps. This path has two components. The first is to conceptualize the category of sex as a back formation from the performance of gender. Sex is gender naturalized. It's an interesting reversal of perspective and sometimes a useful one. It's actually though not all that helpful for trans people who are then perceived as taking gender uh, too literally of seeking to cut and shape embodied sex along the lines of the desire to be another gender. And the visceral experience of the trans body with its own dysphoric flesh then actually doesn't appear uh, uh, in this language at all. And the second move doesn't help us much either. And that's the celebration on, of the non-normative performance of gender as the one that critiques the norm. This just makes the gender non-conformer into an allegory of the norms of the sex gender system itself as queer, a queer theory that's actually sort of a mere continuation of a certain figure in literary modernism. There's little room in this version of queer theory for actual trans people. This non-normative norm is one of play, difference, the exceptional and the fabulous, which is all well and good, except that what's missing is the ordinary and the banal sides of trans lives which are not about performativity so much as precarity and exclusion from the norms of labor, um, particularly for, for trans women, I would argue, uh, that brings poverty, homelessness, violence, incarceration, and early death. The conservative norm might be the most harmful to us, but it's not as if the liberal norm or the queer non-normative norm are kind of all that great either. I wanna to return to the image of the carpenter square, the norma, it's an ambivalent figure. What's promising in it is that it's about praxis, about an act of labor in and against the world. The carpenter takes their square and joins timber at the right angle to build something that someone can use or inhabit. The carpenter does not work alone. Someone else cut the timber, someone else will paint it. Now, metaphysics is the art of forgetting where form comes from. From the carpenter making things square, the metaphysical turn is to make the square more real than the wood, a magical thought made possible by forgetting the labor of making it so. Praxis, collective labor become invisible. The metaphysical essence stands in its place. So we could say the norm, like the commodity, appears shorn of its making. The norm, like the commodity, is both what is proper and someone's property. Through the severing of the ideal of the norm for praxis, the norm itself can become the scene of judgment for the cop, for the market. The liberal and conservative versions of the norm of gender both assert that the state can make proper what best fits the world of property. Whether as trans people, we are included in what's proper and then can be exploited as wage labor, can accumulate property and pass it on within the family, can raise children, can order a birthday cake and so on. The non-normative norm of queerness is sometimes not that different. It's not only performative, but performed to be seen like a show, to be judged by a consumer. It is performed as an alternative to one of both of the other norms, but it still oscillate, oscillates around them as if the norm were a kind of impossible, ideal metaphysical thing. The improper queer gender performance is then the aberration that affirms the norm. Here too, the norm is reified, rendered metaphysical and eventually made spectacular. Collective labor again falls from view. What might transsexual lives become outside of the norm and even outside of norms? 
I use the outside of non norms, that should be. I use the old fashioned word transsexual deliberately, despite its compromised history. We modify not just the social construct of gender, but also our sex. The ambiguous corporeality of sex as it is felt and gender as it expresses itself with others are not really separable. But if one has to choose an emphasis, let me put it on the modification of embodied flesh, embodied sex, that slow, difficult technical art on which many transsexuals labor in pain. Which brings me to the three things, or rather practices, that give me a, a way to endure through the long 2020. Practices that are not unconnected. It's been a bad time for a lot of the trans women that I know. Uh, many do sex work, some are performing artists of other kinds, some tend bar or do other nightlife work, all that shut down and for a long time. And yet it was trans people of all kinds that I saw spring into action to extend networks of mutual aid. It's already what trans people do. It's in the nature of being a transsexual who transforms the body through techniques. That usually requires collective labor to raise the money for one thing. An old joke has it that it's the same $20 that circulates through every trans person's GoFundMe. We also share the work of preparing someone for surgery and nursing them through recovery. We will gift a spare needle or a shot when supplies run low, as happened during the pandemic. Trans care turned out to be a generalizable set of practices. As civilization falls, my hunch is that we have at least one thing to go for us uh, that will help us survive. <laughs> Let me just draw the curtain a little bit. Just, just, whoa. That's better. I got this fabulous sunlight coming in, but then it affects the screen. Uh, to scrape the norm is an art, a kind of labor that willfully or experimentally makes things otherwise. I felt the loss of our collective and public arts deeply during 2020. I come to rely on a kind of distributed sensory being together with other transsexuals at the rave, at the reading, at the opening, dancing or looking or listening to expressions of us, ones that at their best played somewhere else with uh, other tools than the straight and the square. So I could go out, experience that, and sometimes we'd hook up. To be without all that was hard, particularly hard for those whose sensory and sensual practices are distributed rather than squared off into something like uh, a family unit. Over the long 2020, I had to make do with the transsexual arts that can pass along the vector of communication into my quarantine pod. And as Carrie was mentioning, we're, we're good at that too, as it happens and out of necessity. A lot of us have been very isolated before. So we worked on the collective arts of communication through the internet. Sometimes it turned into the discourse, the internalized uh, policing of norms of ourselves, mimicking in mim miniature that which excludes us uh, or elects us as its mascot. But, but not always, sometimes the internet can be fun. The summer of 2020 was also when Black Trans Lives Matter became a slogan within the larger movement of Black Trans Lives. This together with the care and the art was a sign of enduring. At Brooklyn Liberation for Black Trans Lives, I saw 15,000 people gather under the leadership of Black trans women. It's another praxis in and against and around the norm. The most universalizable standpoints are those furthest outside the norm. Those ruled out to at the point of many intersecting lines. One could see it through the language of intersectionality, although somehow to me that seems to leave the lines ruled by the norm intact. You could see it also as a practice of assemblage of differences that differ from each other continually, that shade off, have fuzzy edges. Who knows when the long 2020 will ever end? Who knows if there'll ever be a new normal? There's certainly a struggle over it, displaced onto marginal bodies, deflecting from the disintegration of the climate, the polity, and any regulation of the information on which our collective cyborg body of this planet runs. The specific subset of cyborg bodies, the nodes of the flesh tech uh, continuum that are transsexuals, we will endure. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much to both of you. Um, 
audience, I'll, we'll give you a little time if you have uh, questions. Um, I think what I would be most interested in actually as a cis male who has really, I think, benefited from listening to the voices and from the visibility of uh, trans colleagues, friends, and uh, public generally, is uh, to hear your voices in response to each other. So I don't know if either of you have questions, but I will say that one of the things that I always loved about C21 and still love about C21 is the intersection of disciplinary approaches. And uh, I think, you know, Carrie trained as a sociologist, comes at it from a more sociopolitical perspective, and Mackenzie, a more theoretical sort of post-theoretical, post-Marxist theoretical perspective. But what was really interesting to me in listening to the papers, because I was thinking about the differences of, let's say, uh, what there are, what your scholarly archives are, what do you, you know, who do you draw on and so forth uh, are significant. But what I found really interesting in both presentations was, of course, the necessity to speak from your own position as trans individuals. And I think that in a way, it's like with queer theory, I think we saw this as well, that in the emergence of queer theory, you saw that people a kind of like auto theory, um, a need to uh, talk about your own position. So for me, that's what I think is, that's as valuable as the disciplinary aspects or the crossing aspects are. So I don't have a super question. Well, I guess I'll say one more thing. I started my career as a transcendentalist scholar. And one of the things I always said about the transcendentalists and the way I understood them was that the, the desire of transcendence was not to get to a place, not to leave something transcend and be there, but it was actually the crossing, the act of the trans, the movement across fixed norms like the Carpenter Square or borders that constituted what I thought was so radical and interesting about transcendentalism. And I guess I'd be interested if either of you would want to talk about what about that in relation to trans identity. In other words, how much, how important is it that for trans identity, not to have arrived at a trans identity, but to always mark the kind of crossing or trans, the, the violence to the body that Mackenzie talked to or so forth. And then my more socio-political question, since that maybe is my more theoretical one, is I'd be interested in what either of you have to say about Caitlyn Jenner's uh, candidacy for governor, um, whether yes, Carrie, I can see you rolling your eyes already. So. Yeah, no comment on the second one. <laughs> yeah, it, it, my uh, feelings about Caitlyn Jenner's uh, candidacy have zero to do with her being a trans person <laughs> and everything to do about her politics. And it, the, the problem is when people conflate those two things. Yeah, like, uh, uh, Remember, we used to talk about class as one of the intersections. And, and I think uh, from the point of view of people with money, class is always the, the top uh, identity. Uh, and the others are completely subordinate to that. That's in the history of, of trans women too. Uh, the, the you know white middle-class women transitioning late because they had too much to lose versus Black trans women have you know, have to come out early and have no choice and have nothing to lose. Uh, yeah, that's a whole. There's a whole story in that. I don't know enough about the transcendentalists to ask answer the other question because I wasn't raised in, in America. We had a whole other like literature I I had to read. So my my uh, uh, understanding of it is so glancing. But I kind of wow, that'd be a whole project to do trans studies and transcendentalists. And I'm thinking of it as two axes. Uh, and, and to put those two things in dialogue is like a PhD thesis idea or a book idea, right? That'd be super interesting. I know there's got to be somewhere out there uh, who would do that. There's, there's sort of a lot of discourse about uh, trans as uh, indeterminacy, as uh, a transition that never ends, uh, as trans as the arc rather than the destination, uh, 
there's there's also the uh, difference and sometimes tension between whether uh, you want to be indeterminately in that space or outside of it altogether versus you have a goal. Uh, your transition is to get to a place uh, that would, in a sense, end. Uh, so, I, yeah, it's, it's a little hard. I, I, I think that the analogy is not quite right because, you know, the, the, the absolute sublimity at, at the end of the transcendental you're not going to get to. Um, but to modify your body enough that you can inhabit it is a process that could end, but, but not for everyone. One, one always has to qualify this with some trans people, like there's, you know, we're so varied and so different. I agree with uh, Mackenzie that there is a frequent saying that transition is a, a, a process that never ends. Um, but if you're wealthy enough and we're lucky enough to be born in a body that has the genetic uh, uh, characteristics that make it such that you could modify it enough to be sufficiently happy, for some people it might actually have an end. Um, most trans people I know are always in transition. People who are non-binary and gender fluid have as their goal <laughs> to not have that end. <laughs> um, but uh, it, uh, another commonly said thing that I completely agree with is that all of us are always in transition and trans people, uh, because they are having a certain kind of transition that people are very invested in and comment on all the time, are just more aware of it. I um, mean, that, that, that it's a good thing. That is, you know, if you stopped growing and changing, then you have, in essence, died. <laughs> um, and uh, it's really nice to be brought back to life, so that's good. I, 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 here's just a, a, a thing that I, uh, have you not noticed that some people, many people actually, at the time that they finish their last schooling, whether that's high school or college or whatever that is, they then within a few years have ceased to listen to any new music, um, uh, change the, the kind of jeans they wear, uh, change the sort of glasses, they, everything freezes. They, 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 they hit a wall, it's a, a fashion freeze. And they have ceased to engage in personal development. <laughs> you can just see it in the way that they are locked into that set of music and set of clothes. Um, and for some people, if you are transitioning later in life and that happened to you, it would unhappen to you. And that would be a great thing. You break the log jam, you get to continue to grow and develop. So there are ways in which a gender transition is a very positive experience for tapping into Richard, what you were saying about this process of being in the journey. That would be my two cents. <laughs> so uh, Carrie, would it be, uh, would you be okay with talking about, you know, Mackenzie talked a lot about being a trans woman and some of the issues. And I haven't heard so much about trans men politics. You know, a lot of your posts are often about your uh, partner uh, and things. Yeah. So anyway. Um, just as uh, cis women are disadvantaged with respect to cis men, so trans women are disadvantaged with respect to trans men. And I, my transition process itself has had numerous obstacles that I've had to face, but at a certain point in time, most people stop giving me too much of a hard time, <laughs> right? So long as I am fully clothed and not like trying to go to a swimming pool or the beach or something where people might see more of my body, it's not really an issue to them. Because once you have, are sufficiently read as masculine, you no longer exist as a body, you exist as a mind. And your body is just this lump of flesh that carries you around. As long as it's got like clothing on, nobody cares much about how you present it. Um, and that's very different. Like, consider, for example, teaching evaluations. There's, a, there's an academic thing. <laughs> you teach a class, you get a teaching evaluation. Here, during the few years, uh, first few years of my transition, I had I freaked out my students, it was very clear. But at a certain point, they stopped being so freaked out. And what I can see if I ignore that middle section of like three years of transitional freaking students out is that before my transition, and I have 10 years of teaching evaluations before, people commented all the time about how I dressed and looked, all the time. Like, like they're like they notice like your jewelry and your your, your one of my colleagues people were, said students complained that her bras didn't fit her well enough 
Now you're just a teaching evaluation, right? <laughs> what is the okay? Not you, stop, shut up. Um, <laughs> now nobody has anything to say about how I look. Nobody ever says a thing about it. I might as well be a ghost, completely invisible, or, you know, just a blob protoplasm. Um, and that really illustrates the difference about being embodied as a man and being embodied as a woman um, and the way that people treat that. So um, what is the trans masculine experience like? I mean, there are ways, that, there are certain ways in which trans masculine people are disadvantaged in that, um, in that being more invisible um, can make it harder for people to, uh, find community or come out or um, have people understand what you're talking about. If people's whole idea of gender transition is about trans women and being fixated on trans women's bodies. Um, but mostly, nah, I mean, trans feminine people just deal with a lot more crap than <laughs> trans masculine people. Um, for me, like most of the traumas that I face with regard to my body have to do with being intersex and not with being trans. And that's the privilege of being a trans masculine person. I have a question, maybe for both of you, um, or maybe it's not a question, but an observation about something that I, that echoed across both of your talks. And it has to do with the ways in which both of you pointed out different occasions for um, traditional femininity. And I'm thinking probably also like, especially white femininity becomes the conceit by which dominant forms of power reassert themselves. Um, Mackenzie, this was about, you mentioned that trans women are celebrated, you know, if trans women who pass are celebrated, trans men have harder times. They're not, there's no framework of legibility for that. And we also, I mean, it, that's very clear in the examples that you just gave and carry the story that you, the, the observations you shared about your own experience. I think, I think that's, that's interesting. This reveals there's something about femininity that like, that dominant culture says it wants to protect and that becomes the occasions for these forms of violence. Um, Carrie, in your talk, you talked about how conservatives claim they are protecting women from violence in bathrooms, that that is the occasion on which to restrict trans rights. Um, I don't know, I wonder if either of you have more thoughts about that. I think it is a thing that's uh, specific to uh, experience of trans women as, as being uh, a category of body that's uh, both reviled and desired at the same time. Uh, and I, I, I can't speak for trans masculine experience. I'm not sure it's quite as, as symmetrical because we know gender is an asymmetrical structure. Uh, so there's, there's a particular uh, danger in being both the thing that to which like a hyper desire can attach um, but then also fear and revulsion around that. And the, the, there's a thing specific to the uh, murder of trans women that connect to that, um, particularly in the context of sex work and particularly for trans women of color who are, who are more likely to be more vulnerable for, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and so then clearly whiteness is, is a factor. And I mean, there's, there's, there's a sort of, um, uh, particularly black feminist critique of the things that white feminism centered. Um, there's a colonial critique of how there's a really unexamined version of what gender even is in sort of Western feminism that has a colonial aspect to it. Uh, and, and those things show up magnified when you start to think about uh, the position of trans women in that space. Uh, so I think there's, it's part of the ongoing work of uh, uh, working through fem feminism, not paying attention to what it connects with, uh, you know, sort of trans women and trans men in a different way, like fall into that matrix of unresolved problems that, that require you to rethink how we even got the sex gender language we use in the first place. But not everybody's willing to do that work and actually read through that and figure out, you know what, this, it's kind of weird to build social movements on, on premises we haven't really thought through other than from the for the purposes of instrumentalizing uh, political goals that suit a subset of the people that whose careers and lives and possibilities and so on we're trying to advance. 
And I guess what I would what I would add to that is the like, um, the element of how sex panics have functioned for a century and a half um, as means of resistance against increasing civil rights for people who are marginalized on all sorts of bases. So like I mentioned the 1970s and um, Anita Bryant's Save Our Children campaign and the idea that, that boys were going to be subjected to um, sexual assault by men in bathrooms if you stopped having employment discrimination against gay and lesbian people, which is a really weird mental jump to make. I, I would also mention, you know, that in the 1950s and 60s um, and into the into the 70s with the with uh, desegregation um, civil rights movement focus that there was a whole set of sex panic resistance to the idea of black women and uh, and girls using the same bathrooms as white women and girls as opposed to the sex panic we usually focus on which is the mythic you know rape of white women by black men that came out of um, the end of Reconstruction. But this is this claim that if, uh, you if you desegregate schools, then Black girls will give syphilis to white girls who share the same toilets. And there's two things to say about that. One is uh, you don't get syphilis from toilets, okay? <laughs> but the other is just this is about this mythic contamination and danger in which whatever group it is that you don't want to have equal rights, you portray as a sexual danger to white women and girls um, and as, as contaminating them by getting into their space and spreading, spreading contagion with their bodies. And whether that's seen as like a sexual attack physically or some sort of you know your disease, it's been a longstanding theme and it just keeps being effective and effective and effective. <laughs> and so it keeps getting recycled in new forms and it's, I'm tired of it. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I was thinking, obviously, of the civil rights um, overlaps and parallels with that too. The whole, um, the really long-standing, you know, cover of protecting white femininity—that slavery was an institution designed to protect white femininity—and all those things. Um, yeah, we have a question I wanted to bring in from Craig Campbell who says, thank you so much for this. I appreciate the thoughts on trans labor and am brought to ask, in a world that is to varying degrees unloving, if not actively antagonistic, how does capital generate particular legibilities and possibilities? That is, if capital is not threatened by trans lives, what are the limitations it places on trans life? And how is trans hope potentially invested in or corrupted by capital? Yeah, that's it's interesting and there's a whole, um, discourse around, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the id polar identity is, is just a bunch of uh, uh, liberal issues that don't deal with uh, the real issues of labor. Uh, but if you're talking about trans people are mostly working class, <laughs> or at best, at best, uh, and often excluded from formal labor altogether. Uh, so the the thing is is really kind of exclusion from formal labor would be the first thing you might want to look at, and then trans women, particularly trans women of color, and particularly impoverished, impoverished trans women of color, uh, then given no option but to do sex work. Sex work is a very fine thing to do. I'm on board with that, but to not have a choice but to do that would would be a different issue. Uh, so to what extent is there a, an additional segregation of the labor market? Uh, where someone is sort of relegated to uh, forms of super exploitation uh, or doing forms of labor they might not have chosen to do. So that, that would sort of be the first thing about it. Um, the other thing is there's, there's ways in which uh, the sort of hollowing out of any notion of, of a sort of universal civil compact does mean that there's marketing opportunities uh, for aiming uh, culture and services specifically at uh, trans people of means or the families of trans people of means. Uh, it's possible there's a little more acceptance uh, among parents of trans kids. I, you'd have to study that and have to measure that. I don't want to claim that's novel, but there is something novel in the current environment in designing uh, counseling or um, access to hormones, you know, things like that, or, or just product lines, you know, specifically around, oh, there are households in which transness becomes a marketable identity. There's, there's an element of that. Um, but I think the news is mostly bad that, that 
you know, uh, apart from there, there are very tiny niches in which trans people get uh, to have the same kind of lives uh, other people might have. There's a weird little cluster of uh, trans women in tech and boy, would it be a great sociological study to be done on how that happened uh, and what that means that uh, there are people in my community uh, barely making $20,000 a year and there are people in my community making several hundred thousand dollars a year who are trans and who are contemporaries and you'll see at the same parties, but their uh, life chances have been completely different. But overall, I think transition is bad in terms of how you're going to interact uh, with capital. Yeah, I would, another thing I would add to that picture is what constitutes a successful transition is defined largely as uh, through the lens of what services and goods you have purchased. Yeah. Um, so the, the standards, uh, there's a, what's her name, Tally, uh, wrote a, a book about social death and, uh, um, and, and plastic surgery and looks at several different uh, types of plastic surgery. One that she looks at is uh, facial feminization, which is surgery to reconstruct the skull um, that, you, that is marketed to trans women um, to make them less legibly trans. And how it is that there are these conferences that people go to where they are being you know, introduced into the various services you could get, you could access as a, as a trans woman, where the ante keeps being upped for what you need to do to be successful. And now you have plastic surgeons presenting it as social death to have a face that is visibly trans feminine. And so unless you're able to purchase $120,000 of you know, reconstructing your skull, you, you're going to be murdered and it's your fault. <laughs> so you have to find that money and you have to get your skull reconstructed according to these plastic surgeons who are offering this service um, or you will fail in your transition and it will be a tragedy. So you gotta buy it. Craig says in the chat, snaps slash weeps. Thank you, tough times. <laughs> There's also a Q&A question that's come in. Yes. From, uh, Nevada Hessler. And I can read it if you'd like. Yes, your voice is nicer than mine. <laughs> Initial research has indicated that the prolonged social isolation due to the pandemic has been detrimental to mental health, even when there are digital means to connect with others. Both of you have stated that trans individuals, particularly trans feminine individuals, have needed to isolate since well before the pandemic due to violence, harassment, and bigotry. How has this extended isolation impacted the mental health of trans individuals? Yeah, I get two different uh, stories about that. And, and the other has got to do with uh, people whose subjectivity was, was very distributed, where like, you know, going, going out to bars and clubs, having multiple sexual partners, like that was, that was the version of touch and care and, and, and sexuality that worked and that shut down. I, I think it was a very difficult period for people whose lives were more of that pattern. Uh, and, and, and I only know this anecdotally, but, but yeah, I also know trans women who have very isolated lives um, because they have been uh, previously assaulted, for example, so you don't go out very much, your social life is all online. Uh, so in that context, it was a little bit less unusual uh, that then everybody else joins you in a state that you've already been in. Um, but I, I just know this from my own networks. I, it would be actually super interesting to study that and to see if that was the case, if there was a version of resiliency uh, that that one had because that had been the experience one, that one had had previously. I just want to share an anecdote about how early in the pandemic, there was a, I'm in southeastern Wisconsin at UWM, <clears throat> there was a, a, a group of medical institutions and universities that got together to do this big project of trying to collect, find teams of people who could work together to propose grants, to study things, to solve the issues of COVID. And I invested a huge amount of time getting, trying to get just one of the 130 teams that formed <laughs> to include information about trans folks, to look at um, even LGBTQ plus issues. And, and because 
there all of these teams had people from medical schools on them not a one would do it because this is not genetic <laughs> so how could it uh have an impact on covid and i'm just sitting there going you people you know the reason that people suffer ha have all of these social uh, factors that are involved that is we all now know that it's not just because it's not because like there's some genetic inferiority in indigenous people they have the highest rates of death from covid in the united states it's because of the extreme material inequalities that you know exist and uh, the only there was the only team that would consider it was like looking at whether or not people who had hiv aids um, would suffer more from covid which duh um, and and the, they can't equate <laughs> HIV AIDS with being trans. But no, I really wanted to have an opportunity to study the social factors that contribute to this situation. And there, nobody thought that that was anything the federal government would have any idea, interest in funding. So didn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it is definitely bad for your mental health to be socially isolated. And it's bad for your physical health not to be able to go out into the streets and exercise. And for folks who are not, you know, like on the coasts. <laughs> so, you know, here we are in Wisconsin. My, my spouse, when she goes out to take photographs, she goes out during the day and people like the police approach her and think that she's doing something perverse. Like she's out there to capture people's souls with their camera and make trans things happen to them. So then she goes out walking at night and they curb crawl her. They think she's out there to I don't know what she's like a sex worker and they have to arrest her. So she just she can't go out <laughs> and not get harassed. Um, and that's just the, it, everybody presumes that's what the police are there to make sure that, you know, she's not doing something nefarious as a person who looks like a trans woman out in public. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's really bad for your mental health <laughs> and for your physical health. You wind up being isolated. Um, so uh, absolutely, Nevada. It's not good for you, and um, and people should. I, you know, I really don't feel you need to study that. I feel like people should know and should already know that being socially isolated is bad for you, and that has been already empirically documented. <laughs> Kara, you mentioned being harassed by police, and I'm just wondering what if there's been. I presume there has been a decent amount of literature about police violence against trans people in the same way that obviously we're now so cognizant of police violence against people of color. Yeah, and it's a problem in many places and there are training programs that lots of police have never had. And I, I can tell you an anecdote here. A, um, there was a trans man right <laughs> here in Milwaukee who was accused by a cis woman in a public park of having um, flashed his penis at her and peed at, at, uh, on a tree. Now, I don't know why she didn't like him, but the accusation that she made was not possible <laughs> because of his anatomy. And so he told the police that and they like they arrested him. They were sure he had done something horrible. And he was, he was two days in jail before he got out. I mean, he was a, you know, very, uh, he was he was had very few financial resources and you know had minimal um, you know educational background and you know, didn't know how to how to get access to somebody who would help him in the situation so he just had to wait for two days before they let him out but and while he was there all these police officers came by and and like stared at him and laughed at him and, and um, told him he was a girl and wanted to see his genitals and, and just the stories are just atrocious and that's you know, so proof that not only trans feminine people get harassed, but also the, the level of people's, you know, background and education and willingness to be um, to trans people like human beings can be minimal. <laughs> In uh, New York City just uh, repealed uh, a piece of law that, that was um, called the Walking While Trans Ban, popularly, not, not its official name. Uh, because the, the police were uh, notorious for, yeah, among many other things, uh, uh, arresting uh, trans women on the presumption that they're sex workers uh, uh, just walking down the street. Uh, and, and so even if they are, maybe they just went to the grocery store and they would get like picked up. Uh, and of course, once you're in the criminal justice system, you're sort of never out of it. Then you're likely processed, you might end up in Rikers. 
uh, the the thing that would let them uh, uh, arrest you is like having a, having condoms uh, in your handbag or on your person. Uh, so obviously, safe sex advocates already thought this was a terrible idea. Uh, sex worker advocates got on board with this, and uh, trans advocates, and we kind of have progressive uh, legislature here in New York State, and we're sort of able to make that one little change. But yeah, trans women would tell you like the police know who they are. Uh, so that so they would they would just follow them like follow them around like wait for them to leave the house like pick them up shake them down like over and over and over and over because that's what police do. Uh, so yeah, there is an anthology on um, trans people and mass incarceration. The title of which I'm forgetting, which may, maybe I can uh, find and put in the chat. But that's that's a whole area of of trans activism, particularly for uh, trans women, trans feminine people. Um, partly because of the proximity to sex work, partly because of how police treat uh, trans people, regardless of whether you're actually doing sex work or not. I also, just hearing both of you respond to this, I mean, it, it, I have had the chance already to read the longer version of Carrie's essay. Um, and in it, he talks a lot about um, the ways in which, you know, like, Christianity is a big part of this. And the Christian um, narrative of aggrievement is so strong and is driving a lot of what you're describing with Darvo, like the idea that we are the persecuted. And I wonder if in, in, in this arena, as in many arenas with the struggle for civil rights, um, the problem is that the, the battle is waged primarily in the popular culture and in the media because the terrains of like, the, you know, the legal system, the policing apparatus, all of these other um, arenas of life are so thoroughly, um, trans people are so thoroughly powerless. And that is precisely the reason that, that activism is needed, but it becomes a problem when it, you know, people perceive it in the popular culture as like, well, why is, why are, you know, conservative white people and Christians um, are like, well, why are these issues everywhere? Like, I don't see it as a problem. Of course, it's a problem of, of privilege and perspective, but because it is so, um, so wholly in some ways contained to the realm of popular culture and media that it becomes harder to sort of get out of that and fight it in the terrains in which it needs to be fought, which is to say in, in the legal system and, and, um, to transform policing and all these other places. I don't know if that made sense. I was trying to say something. I, I would just, I would admit to having a, a background as a lawyer, uh, but having admitted that, I, I don't believe that the way we solve things is through laws, although they're helpful. <laughs> but it's, it's, it, 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 it's through changing the way that everyday people treat each other <laughs> that, uh, I mean, that's, that's the most central thing that has to happen. So changing the culture is definitely where we're aimed at. Um, and like, if we talk about Christianity, um, we have seen that change happen if we stop talking about white evangelical Christians, right? Like if you look at black evangelical Christians who also have very conservative uh, opinions about family, nevertheless, you see the majority being in favor of laws to protect LGBTQ plus people as opposed to white evangelical Christians. And that's because empathy for people who are persecuted, even if you think they're doing something wrong, <laughs> exists <laughs> when you're not looking at white evangelical Christians. And, and there are white Christian folks who are not white evangelicals who also have you know, progressive stances on LGBTQ plus people, marry same gender people, you know, have trans pastors, whatever. Um, and all that has to do with the sort of culture that people have and how they're shaping their identity. And changing that stuff is um, much more complicated than changing the law, <laughs> but it's where the real battle is, right? So uh, last chance, if anybody in the audience wants to get in on this conversation. And if not, we can head off into our Friday evening. We'll give a second. Looks like people are happy with what they've heard or at least satisfied. 
So I know it was really great for me to have both of you here um, and to have this conversation. And I anticipate uh, it's something we'll be continuing to uh, address moving forward. So looking forward to both pieces for the book. I haven't read Carrie's yet. And uh, thanks audience, thanks participants and uh, have a good evening. Stay safe. Thank you, Richard, Maureen, Kyle, everybody for coming. Thanks so much, I appreciate it. Great to meet you, Mackenzie. <laughs> Likewise, a pleasure. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Maureen. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Okay. Take care. Bye bye.